This video was brought to you by Raycon. <laughs> hey Arlo. Yeah, alternate universe Arlo. I'm sick. Yeah, me too. We're too sick to go on an ad read adventure today. Yeah. What do you say we get comfy, pop in our Raycon everyday earbuds, and listen to food podcasts all day? Sounds like a plan. Raycons are so sleek and low profile, and their optimized silicone tips fit any ear, so we can lounge and listen in complete comfort. And they last up to eight hours on a charge, and up to 32 hours using the charging case, so we'll never even have to get up and plug them in. Absolutely. I love how I can switch between three sound profiles for when I want to change from podcasts to music. And I can take calls at the touch of a button, so I don't even have to lift my head to speak to someone. And they're water resistant, so during during those long, arduous treks to the bathroom, I don't have to worry about dropping them in the sink because I'm trying to wash my hands while also carrying a bunch of bags of chips, which I keep in the bathroom for ease of access. Don't judge me. No judgment here. Can you believe these Raycons are half the price of other audio brands? And on top of that, you can get 15% off your purchase by heading to buyraycon.com Arlo or by hitting the link down in the description. And all orders come with a 100% happiness guarantee. Sounds like this won't be such a bad time after all. Nope, because Raycon Everyday Earbuds are for every day, even sick days. <coughs> <coughs> oh. Hello, my friends. Uh, so the latest Nintendo Direct brought with it much revelry, but m very much. I, I am I'm actually still currently reveling myself. However, with it came one little detail that seemed a bit less Revelrous? Yes, the rumors were true. Nintendo will be charging $70 for The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This will be, uh, of course, the very first time they've ever charged more than $60 for a game. They've assured us that this is not the new standard. Uh, not every new Nintendo game going forward is gonna be $70. Uh, they're gonna be doing this on a case-by-case -case basis. There are naturally a lot of opinions on this, and uh, I'll tell you right now, I do not even know exactly which side of the fence that I'm on. You know, like I, I don't even know if there is one objectively correct answer to this debate. So instead of trying to convince you directly of anything, I'm instead going to uh, simply explore both sides of the issue. And uh, in order to do this, I will need a little help. Arlo? Yes, Arlo? The new Zelda is $70, and I think that's garbage. Well, I think that's perfectly fine. But why? Well, for starters, and most obviously, inflation has been crazy recently. Just, just everything is more expensive now, so it only makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, I get that, but, but things being more expensive isn't necessarily a good metric to use when considering the price of a game. Right now, the biggest companies in the world are raising prices way more than necessary, which is leading to unprecedented profits and consumers are suffering for it. So I'm already gonna be skeptical of a big company raising a price any significant amount. But look at the big picture. E even ignoring the current crazy inflation, $70 now is much cheaper than it was before. Over the decades, everything has gotten more expensive, but gaming prices have only gone up a very small amount. Adjusting for inflation, back in the day, NES games cost loads of money, well over $100 in today's money. Sure, but gaming itself was so small back then. You know, games were a luxury item that were indeed overpriced because of it. Now you've got way bigger audiences, way more gamers out there, and way more potential profit, especially because of digital distribution. Back then, a physically printed game that might have found an audience of 30,000 with a very, very small profit margin might now effortlessly reach millions. Many, if not all of which, end up buying digitally with zero manufacturing, shipping, or retailer costs. Gaming is no longer a luxury item with a relatively small audience, and it's way, way easier to make money off of them. Yeah, the audience has grown a lot, but budgets have also grown a lot. Games were made by tiny little teams back then. Games today are getting exponentially more expensive to produce. And additionally, on top of that, $70 is just the new standard now. It's just the way it is. But the thing is, in this particular case, we're talking about Nintendo. They are still developing for very old hardware and spending way less money than their competitors. 
This new $70 standard is being set by studios making huge AAA games for current gen hardware. They're employing legions of graphical artists working on numerous complex graphical systems that Nintendo just doesn't have to bother with. We're paying this $70 price for what is, in its own way, essentially an Xbox 360 game. If you split up graphical capability by generation, then the generation that Tears of the Kingdom falls into is nearly 20 years old. It's basically retro. It's nearly as old now as the NES was when it started. Yeah, but it's a lot more complicated than that, isn't it? You know, even if they're using old hardware, these Zelda games are unusually large. You could play the first game for hundreds of hours on one file, and this game looks like it's gonna have probably even more to do. Compared to other Nintendo games, which can be completed in like a few sittings, paying an extra $10 for this one is nothing. I mean, it's absolutely true that Zelda might offer more value than most other Nintendo games, but I kind of feel like that speaks more to how overvalued their other games are, you know? I personally believe that many Nintendo games are indeed way overpriced. Just looking at the entire rest of the industry and what kind of games they're putting out and what they're charging for them. But of course, that's a whole can of worms on its own. But like, basically, other companies are making games for seven $70 that offer just as much content as Zelda, and they look a whole lot better. Yeah, but a lot of the time, those companies aren't even selling full games. They often require paying even more money for DLC and microtransactions and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, sometimes. Initially, the biggest argument against raising prices to $70 was that the companies leading the charge were selling these games for this price, and they would, in addition, have freemium economies with loot boxes and such designed to sap even more money out of you. This felt like the extra $10 was just to, just to line their pockets a little bit more. It's absolutely true. However, there has been a lot of pushback against these kinds of games. And right now, the whole games as a service basket the AAA publishers were putting their eggs in is currently crashing and burning. To, you know, mix metaphors a little bit. Right now, the microtransactions are kind of taking a step back. We are getting more and more huge games with loads of content that look modern, look really, really pretty and awesome, and clearly had very, very big budgets that are only $70, or are sometimes still $60. Also, you think Nintendo's not gonna charge more beyond the 70? 70 is not gonna be the final price for Zelda. You want the full thing, it will obviously be $30 for the expansion pass. Sure, the base game will be a whole game. You know, it's, it's not gonna feel unfinished per se, but I feel like most people who love it are going to want the DLC or else they're missing out. Skip the DLC and you're still getting a whole game, but not the whole game. At the end of the day, I am gonna have to pay a hundred bucks for this game. Again, for what is essentially an Xbox 360 game. You keep saying that, but Nintendo puts more work into their games than a lot of companies, and if not graphically necessarily, then everything else. The design process can be long, loads and loads of R&D, lots of polish, an unusual level of polish. Even if it is an Xbox 360 game, they clearly have spent a lot of time and money on it. It is true that Nintendo does sometimes spend a whole lot of time on a game and that is not necessarily because of its graphical capabilities or whatever, but that time and money spent does not always equate to value. That's just not how this works. I know I sound like a bit of a broken record to some of you out there right now, but if it took Nintendo one or two years to build the foundation of Breath of the Wild, then only a couple years after that to actually create the world and the story and the dungeon, like to basically make the game? Why would a direct sequel using the same foundation and even the same map take six years? Pandemic delayed stuff, but not that much. That amount of time does not make me think that it will be that much better with that much more content. That makes me think it's had a troubled development. Too much time and money spent figuring out what the game even is. 
That's exactly what happened with Skyward Sword. They took a really, really long time to make it because they didn't really know what the game was for a lot of the time. And when it came out, it was not better because of all that time. It was worse. A lot of us had to wait all that time and ended up getting a disappointing game. And even if in this case, we do indeed end up getting a better game because of all that work, how much can you expect to pass all of that off onto the customers? Like, where do you draw the line? You know, like whether the game was managed poorly or the producers were just super perfectionistic or any other reasons why the game would have taken so much time and money to make, is it right to expect the customer to make up for it? If the whole industry is making games with X amount of content for Y amount of money and selling it for Z dollars, and your game also has X amount of content, but you spent two times Y on it, is it fair to charge two times Z? Obviously this isn't a one-to-one -one accurate comparison, but you get the point I'm making. We don't know why Tears of the Kingdom took so long, but one could easily argue that no matter how long it took to make and how expensive it was, they should still just charge us the standard price. Okay, but to swing back around to the uh, specific economic conditions of the day, the Japanese government is asking companies to raise wages by 10% across the board, and Nintendo has obliged. That means they're taking a pretty darn big hit to their profit, which is why it makes sense to slightly raise the price of their biggest, possibly most expensive game ever produced. It is true that they stand to make less profit if they don't raise prices, but, but that's only really a problem if you follow the idea that a company's job is to make as much money as possible at every single opportunity. This game is still going to generate a massive amount of pure profit. Making a tiny bit less profit is only a problem thanks to, at the risk of starting arguments about capitalism in the comments, the current model of publicly traded companies where shareholders who have nothing to do with the creation of games throw a tantrum if they make a tiny bit less money than they did last time. Even if that amount is still millions and millions of dollars for doing literally zero work. If you're still paying all your employees and making a mountain of profit, you are still running a successful business. A slightly shorter mountain of money is not really a problem until greed enters the picture. In these difficult economic times, we, the consumers, at the bottom of the ladder are being forced to pay more just so the super rich people at the top can be that much super richer. And you know what? I feel even more strongly about this because of the weak collector's edition. The collector's edition of this game just does not offer that much for the money. It really feels like they're just trying to make up as much money as possible. And that makes the $70 price feel even more desperate. Ah, but Nintendo isn't trying to make up for the wage increase across the board. This is literally the only game they've priced like this, and other new Switch games are still $60. It seems perfectly fair for them to only increase the price of one single game in their library that probably cost way more than all of their other games to make. I wouldn't be surprised if Zelda costs twice as much to produce as any other series of theirs. In that case, only 10 more dollars is nothing. Yeah, that's a pretty good point. I, I, I cannot defeat it entirely, though I will say that even if Zelda is the only Switch game to cost $70, it all but guarantees that the next system games will all cost $70. Maybe not, but it is the industry standard now, like you said. And that's gonna be harder to justify when they are inevitably still making games on older hardware. PS4 games weren't $70, but the next system will probably be on par with a PS4 in power. But power isn't everything. It comes down to the quality of the games, and Nintendo makes quality games. They often make quality games, but they also often make games with very little content that are hard enough to spend $60 on, so setting a precedent for charging $70 is scary. Like the, like the simple fact that it is now an option, and in the future I might always have to spend $70 on a game even if it's only good for a couple sittings, it's scary! But now this is where I come back to the inflation part of the argument, so we've pretty much gone full circle. Yeah, and that probably means we should just call it a day. Um, well, now that we've explored both sides of the argument, would you say we've come to a conclusion? 
Are we closer to knowing what the answer is to all this? No. So there you have it. 